Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it went quiet. Wish I could do that with my family. Uh, welcome to what I think will be a fascinating evening. But before going any further, I would like to invite Uncle Charles Madden to give us welcome to country. Good, uh, thank you. Good evening, folks. My name is Charles Madden, but known around the inner city of Sydney as Chicka. Now, that's a nickname that I got many, many years ago going to Redburn Public School, which is now NCIE, the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence. Folks, I'm from Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. That's the land we're on at the moment. For many, many years, I've lived and worked around the city of Sydney. I've been involved with many a different Aboriginal organisations. Over the years, I've been a director with the Aboriginal Medical Service at Redfern for over 40 years. Also a director with the Redfern Aboriginal Housing Company, Aboriginal Hostels Australia, and the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. I've got to mention it, folks. Also a life member of the Redfern All Blacks Rugby League Football Club. <laughs> folks, for many, many years I've lived and worked around the city of Sydney. I'd like to take this opportunity this afternoon to, to extend a warm and sincere welcome to any of my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, we have any brothers and sisters here from the Torres Strait or further afar across the seas, welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 that makes up the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bordered by three distinctive landmarks. We have the Orkby River to the north, and the Peen to the west and the Georges River to the south. Those three rivers form the boundaries of the Eora Nation. Folks, if you've travelled across this great city of ours today, the state or this great country, or from afar, welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. Enjoy your stay. Have a safe and trouble-free trip home. Once again, welcome. 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 Thank you. Enjoy the evening, folks. Thank you. Good evening again. I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers, all who have been very much part of my life, who have given me advice, help, and I'm very pleased that they have all three come to Sydney as part of our 50th anniversary celebrations. Jessica Morgan and Nicholas Baum from New York. Don't be fooled by their accents, they are from New York. Jessica is director of the Dia Art Foundation, which is an organization which I admired since a long time, even before Jessica came there. Um, what they achieved around the city of New York and then at Dia Beacon is I think one of the great art destinations, but you'll say more about that. Jessica has been advising me for years. She introduced me to some of the project artists like Tino Segal, Henri Sala, and when really a master of contemporary art, John Baldessari, um, said that, look, Jessica said that you must do a project with me and 
I just can't refuse Jessica. So that's her power in the art world. James Lingwood, director, co-director of Heart Angel, an organization very similar to ours, except they have a lot more live performance and film and theater, has also been a great supporter and advisor to me. I actually, the project where I met Michael Landy with Breakdown was a great Art Angel production. Gregor Schneider, with whom we did a uh, project on Bondi Beach. Um, previously, he has done a very different but very special project in London. And Nicholas Baum is really part of my family. I have known him since he was about this big. <laughs> and he started his career as assistant education manager at MCA and now is director of Public Art Fund in New York and is doing an incredible job, built up an organization much, much larger than what we do. So very happy to have all three of you here in Sydney. The conversation will be led by Maud Page, who is deputy director of the gallery and uh, head of director of collections. I asked Maud to do this because about two years ago or three years ago, she had a conversation with Henri Sala, which was absolutely riveting. And I'm sure that all of you will enjoy that. So please welcome Jessica James and Nick to the stage. But before that, I would also like to acknowledge the custodians of this land, the Heroa Nation, their ancestors, past, present, and emerging. And it really puts our 50th anniversary into perspective, as their history goes back 40,000 years or more. So what's 50 years? It's just a, a speck, really, in our history, and it really goes to show how much we have to learn, how important it is for us to go back in time. So thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Good evening and welcome. Thank you, Uncle Chika, for that welcome. It's always an honour to have you in our house and we are always honoured every time you speak your words. Good night. So you're in for a treat. It's been such a pleasure to look at all of these wonderful people's backgrounds and what they do and it's truly incredible. So I hope... I'm trying not to speak too much because we'll give them all the time that they can because it's their, what they're doing is so, so fabulous. I did want to start though quickly by just acknowledging John Cowdor. And John, you changed the landscape here in Australia and we're very, very fortunate that you did that. You did that a long time ago and you also transformed our own gallery by the wonderful gift that makes us now the gallery that has the most important international collection in Australia and can have a really fabulous discussion with the rest of the world, so thank you. And we celebrate with you your 50 years and it's wonderful that you have the show here with us to do that celebration. So, without further ado, what I'd like to do is to ask a few questions and we said that we do a pretty free-forming conversation, and I did want it to be that you really bring whatever you'd like to bring to the conversation and also make the questions more complex if you want to and need to. So the first thing that comes to mind, and I'm sure we'll get it out of the way because 
I think we need to know what is your connection to John Cowdor, and I believe, James, that you've got a really wonderful story. Um, well, um, yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, well, John's started to tell the story in his introduction, but I can, unusually for me, I can remember it, I can remember the, the time, almost the precise date, and exactly where we were. So it was about nine o'clock in the morning, in early February 2001, on Oxford Street in London. And I was uh, inside preparing for, uh, it, we were in the middle of um, this pretty epic performative installation by Michael Landy called Breakdown, where he systematically, systematically set about um, breaking down and destroying every single one of his six, 7,200 possessions. Um, so, um, and it was, it was a very taxing project to run. So the last thing I needed was to hear someone knocking on the window about an hour before opening time. And I, you know, it's just like this, this guy I didn't know, so I ignored him. I said, you know, I'm busy here. Um, you can imagine, I mean, John is a persistent man. <laughs> he kept on knocking and he, he kind of found his way in. And um, then he introduced himself and uh, we never met before, but his uh, reputation preceded him. Mm. Um, I knew about some of the, 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 the projects that uh, John had done in mm. Sydney. Um, so that was the beginning of, um, so thank you, John, for making, <laughs> making sure you window. got on, got, got in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we've heard about Nicholas, but what about you, Jessica? Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's it. So, yeah. Thanks, James. <coughs> Am I on? No. Yeah. Am I on? Yes. Yeah. Um, more, more prosaic, I'm afraid, but I, I remember being invited to dinner with John, with someone, um, in London, I think it was Matthew Slotover, who's the director of Freeze Out Fair, and he said, you know, somebody you need to meet, and um, I do remember the, the place, we went to dinner at the Wolsey, and I remember thinking John was rather priestly, <laughs> and that, uh, you know, there was a sort of certain austerity to his, uh, his kind of art devotion, um, but it didn't take long to discover that actually he had a wicked sense of humor, and that, in fact, the, the sort of priestly mask was, uh, in fact, a, a sort of subterfuge for something a little bit more, um, uh, how can I say, subversive, let's say. So that was the beginning of, of our friendship. Many, many dinners and breakfasts and lunches and drinks since then. And Nic Nicholas, do you want to add anything apart from being part of the family and living, actually being brought up next to Well, John's I guess, um, I mean, this anniversary uh, has certainly been a moment to, to reflect on I mean, our 54th anniversary, because um, obviously, you know, um, we go back and, and I feel, of course, you, you wonder how your life would be different if you know, certain fluke things just weren't the case. Um, and obviously the fact that my parents decided to buy a home and, and that ended up being next door to, to John and his family was just one of those incredible things that meant I was given the opportunity to see great art and meet artists and people in the art world and like read the books in an amazing art library uh, and really be exposed to that, which when I think about it now is really the mission um, that Calder Art Projects and the Public Art Fund uh, are, are all about, which is sort of allowing everybody to have great experiences of contemporary art. Mm -hmm. so, so it's beautiful that we sort of are able to continue our personal relationship um, also in this kind of world. And John is, I mean, John's name, as, as James sort of suggested, has opened innumerable doors for me. Um, and we you know, I've learned so much from John and continue to and exchange ideas. So uh, it's a wonderful blessing. Yes, agreed on all of those things. Jessica, I'm going to go to you and just with Dia, you've done so many things since you began there in 2015. And 
there's too many to, to really talk about, but there's a couple of things that I think are truly extraordinary and bear mentioning, and that is the fact that you have brought in women to fill in those gaps in the canon, and you've done that beautifully, and there's a whole list of them now that people can look at and really take as being on par to all of the ones that are, were taught and are still taught, and I think that that's a project that is fairly recent still for all of us. So great that you are leading in such a fabulous way. And the other one is also diversity. I think the fact that that canon is disrupted through artists of different cultural backgrounds is hugely important. We know that now. So wonderful to watch, and we really watch with much, much admiration. On that note, uh, I looked at Alora and Calcedilla, which was a project that has been uh, reprised. It was number 26 of the project, Stop, Repair and Prepare. Um, in 2015, you actually worked with them, and it was the first DEA commission that was done outside of the US since 1982, I believe. And it's a project that is uh, called Puerto Rican-liked, Cuervos, cuervas, see, I have to take my, my glasses. Cuevos vientos. That's right. Cueva vientos in Puerto Rico. Can you tell us a little bit about that work and the premise of that project? Sure. I mean, it was, um, I mean, it is, I should say, uh, a very important project for us and one that, in fact, it was closed by the, the hurricane, the terrible hurricane that's really devastated Puerto Rico and which people are still really recovering from there, but we nevertheless hope to reopen it. But it was, a, um, in a sense, a continuation really of trying to think about this history of land art, which is a very important foundational um, aspect of, of DIA's program, commissioning artists to work in the land, whether it's Walter de Maria's Lightning Field from 1977 or the most recent addition to that, which was the work of Nancy Holt's Sun Tunnels um, in Utah, which she created between 73 and 76. But the idea was really to think about, well, how would artists work in the land now? And Jennifer and Guillermo um, are based in Puerto Rico. They've, they've had their entire practice there really now for decades. And much of their work has really been addressing the landscape of Puerto Rico, the very complicated relationship with the US. I mean, it is in fact part of the US. Um, the history of the military occupation of the land, the um, chemical industry that had, had really um, sort of scarred the landscape and, and left um, the complicated resources within the country, um, the privatization of the water system, the electrical um, supply. It's an incredibly fraught landscape. And Jennifer and Guillermo approached this project really as a chance to kind of for start to a project in Puerto Rico where, you know, despite the fact that they'd lived there for many decades, they'd never had a major project, but to really produce a work um, that thought about this history of landscape and in particular the way in which land art is so much about the journey. Um, the, it's obviously the, the, the work itself is always an incredible thing to encounter, but in almost all of the projects that we run, Spiral Jetty, Sun Tunnels, Lightning Field, um, it's really the, the process of getting there that is um, as much part of the work as the, the work itself, let's say, or the object itself or the installation itself. Um, and Jennifer and Guillermo um, worked with us for, for a long period of time, actually, to identify a landscape that, that I, it, we'll try and make this short, <laughs> it's a hard thing to make short. Um, the landscape of Puerto Rico is a limestone landscape and there's an incredible cave network. As you drive through it, it looks like a sort of hilly, beautiful, lush um, landscape with hills, but in fact, underneath those hills are often incredible cave networks. Um, and they were looking for a, a particular type of cave in which to install an artwork that they'd shown previously. In fact, I'd shown it with them at Tate Modern years before, um, which is a work of Dan Flavin titled Puerto Rican Light, a work that he made in uh, 1972, but which was uh, sort of altered, I suppose, by, by the artists in order to have a battery pack, which is a solar battery pack um, where the, the battery has been charged essentially by the sun in Puerto Rico. So it's kind of tautology of the piece where it's an artwork by Dan Flavin titled Puerto Rican Light, charged with Puerto Rican Light. Um, so the, the location itself was, in the end, this extraordinary cave, um, which again, you reach through this sort of journey through a landscape, a, a nature preserve. We worked with a, a, an incredible land trust in Puerto Rico to place it there that took you through a landscape that was um, both a desert landscape and then at, at some point a kind of lush 
uh, wet landscape, so sort of giving you a sense of what the richness of the Puerto Rican landscape is, and then arriving in this incredible cave where right far, far, far back, it was a 100 meter high cave, um, this work of Dan Flavin was installed. Um, and whenever it was needed, the, the battery pack re was replaced and, and subcharged sort of during the period that it was there. On your journey to arrive at this cave, you actually passed the kind of incredible industrial debris of the chemical industry that left Puerto Rico at a point when the tax um, benefits expired. So you had this kind of tour, really, of both you know the, the beauty of the landscape, the horrors of this kind of um, very complicated relationship with the US and, in fact, international business in, in general in Puerto Rico. Um, but then, of course, a reflection on this, this um, ecological crisis, which is you know, very real in Puerto Rico and is resulting in, in all kinds of um, sort of resource um, demands, but, but also a kind of sublime experience in this incredible cave with the, the work of Flavin in, in the background. So that's a very long explanation for <laughs> what, was, what is an incredible project, as I say. I'm hoping we'll be reopening it in about a year's time. Right, oh, fantastic. Look, I think all of your projects would necessitate at, at least a little bit of explanation because that is the nature of them. They really are very involved and very complex. Just one little thing, just in terms of the organisation, how did you get them ready for that kind of experience? You know, how, how do you work externally? Did, was there a lot of discussion? Was there it, any... That, that was a particularly complicated mm. one. I mean, we were working with the Land Trust... Um, Para la Naturaleza, which is an, a really incredible group in Puerto Rico that's been gradually buying up areas of the landscape um, in order to preserve it and, and, in fact, sort of buy back Puerto Rico almost, mm. you know, instead of this incredible political act of sort of reclaiming territory. Um, so we worked closely with them. We worked very closely with the museum in Ponce, where there's an incredible director, um, Alejandro, who was sort of very closely connected with us because, as you can imagine, that, so that, what I didn't mention is that Flavin work belongs to us alongside, this is more than 100 works by Flavin we have in the collection, but of course we wanted to protect it. It's a cave that's full of bats. We didn't want guana all over the Dan Flavin, so <laughs> there was a whole conservation effort, and yeah. there was an incredible uh, man who was in charge of conservation at, at the Ponce Museum who devised this extraordinary kind of case that was invisible once it was in the back of the cage, but, of, of cave, but... Um, was basically protecting the Flavin work. So there were multiple, multiple people involved in this, the people who were doing the landscaping, mm. the community who lived immediately um, adjacent to this property, which was um, you know, not a property that had been made publicly accessible by the land group mm. previously. They run various sites which are publicly accessible, but not this one. So that was also you know, a whole process of, of, sort of familiarize, familiarizing um, our neighbors at that point with what we were doing and why we were doing it and, and who we were. And then the outreach for the project itself. It was a project that was almost in exclusively visited by people in Puerto Rico. It was really intended um, for the people there and for people also to encounter Jennifer and Guillermo's work, which again had been you know, so much invested in, in this history and in this country. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there were sort of many, many, many other nuances to this, but it was uh, yeah, a, a complicated project, but I think that's also the sort of legacy of it is precisely that we're still so close to all of these people, um, continue to work with them even though the project hasn't been there. Yeah. So that there's a, a kind of ongoing connection. Uh, Which is a lovely idea, that idea of remnants of all of these projects that happen outside institutions, particularly when it's public art, and how they, at some point, will form a whole ecology. And it'd be wonderful if more people were involved with art, <laughs> frankly. James, can I go to you? Because I think Art Angel equally has such complex projects as well. And um, for me, I noted a, a particular... I mean, one of the things, first, I should say is that in John describing Art Angel, I love that you describe it, extraordinary art, unexpected places. And, and indeed, you do. There's places that people can only dream of that you do work with. And I note that in 2001, Jeremy Dello, who won the 2004 Turner Prize, collaborated with you on the Battle of Orgreave, which was a full-scale reenactment of the confrontation between the miners, the mining community, and the police in South Yorkshire in 1984. And Della said of Art Angel, the only people in Britain who were going to do that and the only people capable of doing that. So it's, it kind of gives an idea of how you work. There's 800 people on that production, so it's, it's huge, and we may come back to that. But I, I also noted that your most recent project, because that was, as I said, a while ago, is something with Steve McQueen, where you have photographed every year three class in London 
and then showed it at Tate Britain, and it's gone th on billboards throughout London. And I'm interested because my son's in grade three. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, look, what I'd love to learn is just about a little bit about the process of collaboration, because obviously from 800 to year three classes, how 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 do you do how do you do it, and what are some of the unexpected outcomes? I think. And you can go into, perhaps this is where we can get a little more complex, if some of the things that maybe haven't qu gone quite as you would like them to have. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think the, the kind of, the characteristic that uh, is shared by both those projects you mentioned, Jeremy Della's Battle of Orgreave and Steve McQueen's Year Three, is actually essentially they're very simple proposals. And I actually sometimes think that some of our more logistically complex projects have, have just come to us. I mean, in the case of, of Jeremy Della, it was a proposal to an open call mm. that we made. It was in the era of the fax. And he sent his proposal by fax, and it was, he actually sent three proposals. And, and one of them was he just said, I would like to um, restage the Battle of Orgreave with civil reenactment societies, Jeremy Della. Mm. Actually, we don't think he ever really thought it was possible. He just thought he'd like throw it out there. Um, but we, we sort of called him in and we, we talked about it. And um, so from the very simple idea, obviously the complexities start to unfold. It's like, this is contested history. Jeremy wanted yes. to make this project because um, it was um, a history that had been told from the perspective of uh, the victors mm. in that particular struggle, um, uh, the, the Thatcher government against uh, uh, union uh, mm. labor. Um, and, you know, it was, um, it was an experience which was very alive in the sort of mining communities in mm. South Yorkshire. So it's the first complaint, how do you negotiate mm. this relationship? How, because uh, the proposal was um, that the reenactment um, would be um, would bring together two very different kinds of communities. So there were the invitation went out initially to um, uh, people who had who had participated in the miners' strike in the in the mid 1980s mm -hmm. in South Yorkshire, and it was mainly often sons or nephews mm -hmm. or other relatives who came forward. and And, and Jeremy always said um, that you know he. Um, and he was working with my colleague, actually, Michael Morris, on this project. Michael mm. was the lead, lead producer on it. That um, if, if the community at any point had told him that they thought it was inappropriate or in bad taste mm. uh, or not right, that he wouldn't have continued. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So most of the work um, on his, from his point of view was, was to build a trust mm. about um, what was on the face of it, a kind mm. of very odd proposal. Um, and then we had to, um, you know, you meet all sorts of interesting people when you get involved in these productions, and we, we learned about the whole world of reenactment societies. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> who, who, who normally, uh, do you have reenactment societies in Australia? I don't know, <laughs> do we? I mean, yeah. they sort of yeah. basically, um, I mean, in, in Britain they normally reenact um, the, the sort of the Romans against the Britons or, <laughs> um, or, um, or the English Civil War, mm. um, um, the Roundheads against the Cavaliers. And in fact, for a while, Jeremy wanted to call his project the English Civil War Part Two. <laughs> um, and uh, so they're kind of like weekend warriors, really, mm. who sort of turn up. So com a completely different culture to the culture of the mining communities. So obviously the real challenge was somehow how I do bet. you put these yeah. two communities yes. together? But again, it was done with, I mean, Jeremy's genius is his fascination and interest in people. Mm. Um, and he was able, um, I mean, he didn't really, he just talked to them very mm. openly about what he wanted to mm. do and why he wanted to do it and just was able to bring people mm. on, on the journey with him, which was a, 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 a three-year a three journey, which ended up in a one-day Yes. Um, reenactment, um, more or less, in, in the village of Orgreave, where mm. some of the main, the, 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 the most uh, violent conflicts mm. between the, the police and the striking miners had happened. Extraordinary. Um, and just um, sort of segue across to, to Steve McQueen's Year Three project, 
Um, again, I mean, it was about 10 years ago that mm. Steve um, was in touch and he said, yeah, what I really want to do, I want to make a, I want to get a photograph of every year three class. It's, uh, he's been looking at his own class photograph with his mother's when he was mm. seven years old and a kind of picture of um, what, you know, that, his little society, because I think each class photo is a kind of, it's almost like the first society mm. that a child becomes part of, mm. you know, one where they don't, it's not necessarily chosen for them. You know, they have to start to learn to get along mm. with others. Mm. And obviously in the case of Steve, you know, he was a young black boy mm. uh, in London and most of the others in his class were not. Right. And he was very mm. interested to see yeah. how that, what that might look like today. Mm. Anyway, the, we, we made a, an initial attempt to try and get it off the ground. We failed. It just went away as an idea. And then it came back about three years ago um, because he'd also been invited to um, make a big survey at the Tate. And, you know, I think we realized that with the kind of the, the muscle of, of the Tate, because this was an incredibly expensive project, mm. a lot of fun, you know, a team of 10 photographers mm. working for a year, 76,000 individual permission slips had to be signed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, to bring together, um, as you say, 3,000 yes. 3, plus, plus photographs. But again, the idea was mm. actually very simple and very clear. And I, I, mm. I find that's quite often the case. Mm. You know, there's an artist, they've just got some kind of picture mm. in their mind which actually remains quite constant all the way through. Yes. They may not know, none of us know mm. the route to get to the materialization of the idea, but it was. I think in both these cases and some other big, difficult mm. projects we've done, there's a kind of simply expressed idea. Yes. I would like to make a cast, yes. a concrete cast of a terraced house, um, <laughs> yes. which you yes. then, and your job, our job as producers, mm. is to uh, turn that idea into mm. uh, a material form. Yes, yes. So simplicity and gestation yeah. Of, yeah. of ideas yeah. Yeah. till they're ready. I think yeah. that'll come back as a thematic through our conversation. Nicholas, I want to go to you because the Public Art Fund in New York, you talk about it as free exhibitions, which I was quite interested in rather than public artworks. And they are of international scope. And you, from what I could see, you... So unfortunately, I haven't experienced any, but you work from bus shelters all the way into public uh, gardens and other uh, major places. Your 2020 programs has five major solos, and they're, they're very complex projects, and I'll, I'll refer to some a little bit later. But having begun your career with Caldor Art Projects and having been too young to partake in the first one, the 1969 um, work with uh, Christo and Jean-Claude. You then went on to work on something for the MCA, which was a show from uh, Christo and Jean-Claude to Jeff Koons in 1995. And I just wanted to know a little bit more how, how that shaped what you then became so interested in doing. Because it's obviously really varied from looking at your program. You're quite, it's, it's quite a I would say it's quite an activist program, but it kind of really, the breadth of it is, is huge. Well, you know, it, uh, it makes me realise, John, when you look at the history of, uh, of his organisation, it was originally, I think, um, John Caldor Projects. Mm. The word art wasn't even a part of it. Mm. Um, then I think it was you know, John Caldor Art Projects, then Caldor Public Art mm. Projects. Mm. You know, the whole... I think what I learned from John and still believe, and we've sort of talked about this as well, um, in a sense, public art is a convenient term um, that we fall back on. But we're not really... I mean, we're interested in art. Mm. And... Uh, we don't necessarily talk about museum art, mm. um, or if you do, it, it might be an insult. Um, so these categories in, inevitably become a bit limiting. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, John has always, sort of, at the end of the day, been most interested in working with artists who are really inspiring and talented and 
Uh, and, and with these kinds of opportunities, they're able to do something they could never do mm. in a museum mm. or in another context. And I think about um, our exhibition program in the sense that um, I think for organisations like ours that do not have a brick-and-mortar existence, mm. um, they can be perceived only in relation to like these sort of episodic things that happen. Mm. So it's very nomadic and kind of slippery and hard to pin down. Um, we're in the fortunate position of having a number of sites around New York City that are like our galleries. Mm. You know, we program them mm. on a regular basis. And then we will also respond to an artist's idea or, or pitch an artist a location that we know we could have access to or just ask them, come to New York and you know, let's look around and, and see if some idea emerges. Um, but then altogether, those things become a program. Mm. They're not just one thing and then another thing. Um, and some of the slides, I guess, that have been going on are from our kind of recent program. And one of the things I love is that, uh, you know, we recently did an exhibition with an extraordinary artist, Carmen Herrera. Um, it was Carmen's debut public art exhibition, um, series of sort of geometric, abstract sculptures, very colorful work. They're actually behind, which is great. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> there, it, there it is. Um, and uh, Carmen's a Cuban-American artist. She has lived in New York, you know, the bulk of her life, and she was really overlooked until mm. very recently. She's only had attention in about the last 10 years. Mm. These are works that she mostly conceived in the 1960s, and finally, at the age of 104, oh. Oh. she is showing this work. Yes. And it's fantastic because it makes every other artist we work with feel like they're still a young artist. <laughs> um, so John, you know, 50 years, so uh, definitely geological time. Thank you. I've also noted that you said that you don't want people to have to read what something is about. You want people to experience it. In terms of that's something that we're all interested in, how much information do you need to give? And I guess for all of you that do this public artwork where you don't, you, you don't have the walls to necessarily put things on and information to kind of lead the visitor to understand the work. Can you say a little bit more about that and whether that is a running philosophy or you might work sometimes like that, sometimes not? Well, I mean, as I think about it, maybe that's another thing I kind of got from John, mm. um, who's not particularly into um, elaborate uh, discourse about art and its intentions and, mm. and as we know most artists hate doing that as well uh, but I think at, at bottom line it's really that there is an educated audience for mm. art that goes to museums and galleries and has an education but in the public realm you can't assume mm. that knowledge and I think the artists who succeed in that context are the artists who are interested in finding a, a direct connection. Mm. And which is not to say that there may not be multiple layers that mm. you can explore and research and we put as much as we can, you know, online. And, but really you can't have a resource room in Central Park. No. Mm. Um, it's, it's there, you yes. can maybe get one small sign mm. Uh, but it, it has to work sort of on an intuitive level yes. and for all kinds of different people. Mm. And, and that's why I think it's incredibly hard to make a really successful public artwork. Yes. Mm. And Great. at the same time, when it happens, it's mm. really extraordinary. Yes. Completely agree, and I think it's anyone that has dabbled in public art understands that once you're in it, it's it's ex much much more complex than you've ever dreamed. So I do I do note that well. 
One of the things that I looked at when I was um, observing your works too is that you've all had such a presence internationally, like Jessica, you curated Guangzhou. James, you've, you've gone and curated in a whole lot of different places, like the Museo Reina for uh, Sofia, and also in Seoul, and also Nicholas, you bring international artists from different backgrounds and countries to New York. And one of the questions that we discussed a little bit at lunch, but it'd be great to share, is just whether we must always consider the local. The local has been something that was missing before in art historical dialogue. I think we, we tended to think of other things then. The local came back, and now there is that, that real strength in it. Do you think that we still need to address the local in the way that we were? Does it always need to be that that's the intention? So if you could kind of give me a nuanced um, answer on that, because it's, it, it's qu quite a, I think, quite a complex idea. I can jump in. I mean, I was thinking about different responses off the top of my head. I mean, one was um, certainly in the example of Guangzhou, I went, I, I wanted to do the Guangzhou Biennale precisely in order to learn mm. about Korean art and yeah. in particular to learn more about Guangzhou, which is mm. a particularly potent, important place. Mm. It was the beginning of the uprising of the um, movement towards um, the, well, the end of the, mm. the military dictatorship in Korea. But um, I suppose to speak to our collection and some of the things that we've been doing um, to expand the collection, as you were you were commenting on. Um, in fact, it's incredibly local, and I think part of the effort um, that we've been making in order to expand and diversify the collection is to actually give a much more um, accurate presentation of what was the local situation mm. in New York or DC mm. or, or let's say the US in particular, um, which our collection still focuses on by and large. Um, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, mm. and that if you go back to that moment in time and you look at the artists who were showing at someone like Bicot Gallery, which was one of the sort of more experimental galleries at that time, you have as many Dorothea Rockburns and Anne Truitts as you have um, Barry LeVays and Mel Bochner's. So, um, you know, that, that, that um, equality, um, gender equality, was much more present at that mm. moment, um, and it was over time that we managed to gradually erase yes. most of the women from our art history for mm. numerous reasons that we can talk about. But um, so the, the local, it, it is the local. That you know? is the local too, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah, mm. I mean the local can be so many things, mm. right? Mm. Well, I suppose that, you know, you, you pose the question of the, of the local or even the regional it's in a way, it's a question that comes after the idea of a kind of international language, which, mm. um, which gets kind of uh, circulates around the world. So I think um, the work that, um, that we're involved with and I, uh, is, is about um, uh, inviting artists who are very aware of context, mm. at least. Um, it doesn't mean to say that the work has to be local, but mm. it has to be aware of its mm. locality. Mm. Um, you know, every artist comes with a language, you know, their work um, becomes meaningful because it finds a particular form and often they bring that language mm. and that way of working to a particular place. But I think um, attentiveness to what that place might mean, the fact mm. that it's a kind of active, even quite volatile, element in the kind of chemistry of, a, of making a work rather mm. than just a, a passive place that you can put something which mm. is a kind of international language, you know, is, is the kind of uh, culture in which mm. I think I would situate our work anyway. Mm. And I think although we're London, New York, whatever, I, I'm also it's very important for Art Angel that we, we try not to point artists towards places. Yes. Um, I think we're more interested in artists pointing us towards a place that they, it's particularly important or meaningful for them to work in. Do you and have to point them to be aware of the local though once they choose it or not? You well, I would prefer them to, yeah. them to kind of... Um, to guide, uh, to, to guide yeah. me to a, a locality mm. or a situation, yes. if you like, or a, or a culture mm. which... Uh, is important to them. So, mm. for example, with um, the artist Ronnie Horn, um, mm. you know, started a dialogue with her um, 
you know, some, you know, many years back. And it was kind of clear that she didn't, she, she, she'd made work in London. She had museums and gallery shows. And what she really wanted to do was to make a long-term project mm -hmm. in a place which was of particular importance to her, which was yes. Iceland, yes. which she described as a kind of open-air studio for her. Mm. And she'd been spending time there for 20, 25 years. So she sort of said, well, would Art Angel as well sense, go on a journey with her to make a mm. project in Iceland. And unfortunately, I've got a very um, forgiving board <laughs> <laughs> who sort of said, well, see if you can make it work. Yes. Um, and it ended up making this project called uh, the Library of Water mm. in a very specific locality on the mm. southwest coast of, of Iceland, it looks um, which is about that place. Mm. Um, but I couldn't have, you know, I mean, it's, the artist brought that place to us. To, yes. Yeah. And then in terms of your engagement with that place, how does that happen? Or it just that's, that's the whole beauty of Art Angel is that you realise these works and then you, you let them be. It's not about... Well, it's not as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> I was if, trying if to be only. poetic. <laughs> um, well, you know, you, you, you know, all of these projects are built through collaborations of different yes. kinds. And so you're starting off with, I mean, in that instance uh, there were connections that Ronnie had we had mm. to build uh, a relation a set of relationships um, in this small town mm. uh, and those continue to be need to be nurtured I mean I mm. think we're on our sort of sixth mayor now um, and you start again each time and mm. sort of to try and explain to them why it's important that they look after this work mm. Mm. Um, so it's complicated. Yes. And do um, you find people do that, that journey? People it, that are interested in your projects? It's very much as, as Jessica described in terms of um, the importance of the journey mm. to the work as much as yes. the work itself. I mean, to have a destination. Mm. But you're, I mean, so you're, you're um, sensitised and primed by mm. uh, a journey, let's say, as a, as a foreigner to Iceland, anyway, um, from, from Reykjavik through these... You know, incredibly powerful elemental landscapes, mm. um, and where you're aware of the the, the presence of water yes. everywhere. To arrive at this place, which um, contains 24 columns of of water from 24 glaciers mm. um, around uh, around Iceland. Yes. So I think the journey. I mean, I I'm also even even in in a in a city. You know, I, I think the journey to a place yes. in a city. Is, all, is often mm. very important for Absolutely. the work. Absolutely. Mm. I, I, mean, I think of John's yeah. projects too, but also the Biennale and the wonderful Cockatoo Island, and that journey yeah. is equally important to get to that art experience. So I understand that. What about you, Nicholas, in terms, to go back to that question of the local, mm -hmm. do you have something to say about that? Yeah, I guess it... it um, I think James is right, the... Um, this, it's sort of counterposed to the idea of the international mm. and maybe we're at a moment where uh, global, the limits of globalisation, the ruptures mm. are very apparent mm. and they're playing out in all kinds of ways that are disturbing in the kind of crude exercise of political power mm. that can be very repressive and, and disempowering. Mm. Um, and at the same time, that then enables a reaction mm. or a politicising uh, of, of people who are feeling that exclusion mm. and maybe a curiosity about those people mm. that also hadn't been so present. Uh, so I, I think we are at a moment where a lot of artists um, are interested in exploring um, ideas, histories, communities, and connections that are very rooted in sort of very specific uh, people's mm. uh, histories and existences and lives. Um, and, and that, I think, is exciting and, mm. and interesting. And it also as public art is something that unfolds sort of in our shared space. It yes. is an expression of our community values in a mm. way, or what values do we share at mm. a basic level, freedom of expression, mm. say, in a mm. kind of Western democratic context. But even that feels like it has to be defended. 
uh, I mean, I'm talking about the US, um, and maybe I, there, are, there are other ways that unfolds around the world. So it's a, it feels like a very complex moment mm. um, with a lot of very scary things, um, but also kind of opportunities to mm. um, to resist, uh, to to use creativity, mm. to think about different solutions, or different ways mm. of approaching issues. Mm. Um, so I think you know the local to me has that resonance. Yes. And perhaps what you're saying is also the local changes according to obviously which country you're in, but also the timing of what's happening in that particular country at the moment, like for you both in terms of the US, very different to what perhaps is happening in the UK, although UK and well, Australia similar, are, similar, are, are similar tread trajectories lightly there. But, but, but <laughs> we're, we're competing. No, think, we're yes, actually yes, competing. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll go to my next question. <laughs> Look, one of the observations, too, that I've made is obviously we, you know, we're celebrating uh, KPAP with 50 years of celebration. DIA was founded in 1974 and Public Art Fund in 1977 and Art Angel in 1985. And there are now many other organisations that actually claim that space and, and claim the space of being the leaders of or, or have a really strong kind of input into into those areas that we're looking at. What do you think that you each bring that's unique and that's continued? Because obviously it's your organisations are so strong and so known. So what do you think that you bring in particular that has made it, that still makes it so strong? So what's unique about what you do? <laughs> um, I, I think it's probably somewhat the opposite of what we've been talking about, which is... Um, the, the notion of permanence, you know, I mean, yes. DIA was, the name DIA is not an acronym, it's capital D, small yes. I, small A, it means through, it means journey, yes. um, and this idea of uh, temporality is really at the heart of the institution. I mean, for us, a, a sort of short exhibition is, is probably a year, you know, yes. um, but in fact, many of our projects are really intended to be there forever, and, mm. and we were founded with the, um, with the concept, really, of, of, of trying to identify contemporary artists, artists of our time, um, whose work would live on in the same way that we, um, without question, um, assume that works that have been um, in the, the Sistine Chapel or so mm. forth would, would, you know, remain forever mm. and be preserved forever. So, uh, you know, I think this, this idea of permanence and with that, the idea of constant change, that every time you mm. revisit one of these spaces or places or sites, you come with a different frame of mind, you come at a different time of year, at a different yes. moment of light, a different type of um, knowledge about that work mm. or, or the world for that mm. matter. Um, so this, I think, is really at the heart of DIA and, it, and it's yes. very unusual. Um, it is. It's, a, it's something that I think we, we sort of fight to preserve, really, mm. every time we're on the verge of, of kind of capitulating to this more, 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 faster, faster, faster. It's kind of resist and, mm. and try and stay true to that, which is not that everybody else should follow that model, it's more that that, that is the, the nature of the institution and, and to protect it and that ethos seems incredibly important. Mm. And incredibly needed, I think, so that's why I did want to ask the question because having noticed that, I think that it is quite, as you say, um, unusual in contemporary art world where it's, there's a, that perception that, that you have to keep changing things to maintain people's interest so it is, it is interesting to note how that slowing down and the actual part of looking carefully is, is so valued still, and we must keep that. So, agree. What about you, Jeff? Well, I don't think I, we would claim uniqueness, but... Um, <laughs> I know, it's a um, terrible word. There's a I, few uh, terrible <coughs> words in these. Um, I mean, I think what makes each of our organisations unique is what has been done. That's right. You know, yeah. our, our, each of our histories... Mm. Uh, are but you have to choose them, though. Um, so. But I think what probably is distinctive, mm. let's say, about um, about Art Angel, I always think that we we should be an organisation which um, uh, does. We never ask an artist to conform to some mm. pre-existing notion of what they should be doing, mm. um, and. What it means is that we, as, a, as an organisation, should constantly be... A, we should be quite, quite amoebic-like. We should be changing shape. Mm. We should be... You know, I think our flexibility... It's mm. not like saying, well, we can't do that because yes. we're this kind of organisation. Mm. 
we have to change ourselves mm. so that we're, we can make these kinds of projects happen. So a certain kind of fluidity and flexibility yes. in yes. terms of our shape yes. and our approach. So, mm. you know, because in a sense, you know, this is about, um, you know, incredible spectrum of mm. different ways of making art in different kinds mm. of places now. Mm. And you can't approach that kind of diversity by uh, having a kind of fixed rules of engagement. Yes, yes. And I guess you let people dream, because as you were saying when you were explaining with the, with the Battle of Orgreave example, that it came as an idea that you have a, an inkling that, that he might not even have known what he was yeah. you know, I think asking, I, but yeah, it's I mean, a dream. I think it, it's, it's interesting. I always think that you know, there are lots of really interesting ideas which are kind of latent. Sometimes I think artists don't often feel they've almost got permission to share mm. their kind of boldest, kind of wildest ideas. Mm. And I think one of the, the, the functions that we probably do share as an organisation is somehow to be a sort of trigger, mm. uh, which enables some of these really kind of unwieldy and challenging ideas to be shared. Yes. And in that sort of sharing, they suddenly, maybe they are possible. Mm. And do you think, and I'm digressing, but do you think that in your choice of them, obviously you've got a lot of ideas that come to you, in your choice of them that says something about Archangel 2, because you, you have to select? Um, <clears throat> well, strange enough, we don't get a lot of ideas coming to us, okay. <laughs> actually. Mm. Um, and we, you know, we more sort of, um, the projects emerge out of long, well, conversations, yes. really. Um, where you build a kind of uh, sort of kind of like a microclimate mm. of trust, mm. which enables ideas to be shared. Actually, some of them to be sort of pushed to one side because mm. you know, maybe mm. that doesn't sort of seem right without mm. it being a rejection. Yes. Um, and you know, it's very it's it's very imprecise. You never at a certain point you find yourself you've actually yeah you're doing this now. <laughs> mm. You're no longer talking about it. You you know you've stopped circling the idea and mm. you actually. You know, you're, okay. you're, you're in it. Yes, which um, is quite interesting of you saying that you don't get that many ideas <coughs> come, coming to you because you also mentioned that you don't normally work with the same artists. Mm -hmm. So that then you... If you did, if you, you could have followed what you were saying in terms of knowing an artist well and then being able to really push and develop together <coughs> different things throughout the artist's career, but, but you don't no, do I'm that. No, I'm quite envious of, of um, organisations or people where you can have those mm. long-term relationships. I mean, Deer, yeah, I think, is yeah. emblematic yes. of that, where mm. you know, one great idea leads to another. But mm. that was essentially the time where, where Deer was really, um, uh, you know, I think, was, was set up by three you know, you know, privately funded mm. projects with that kind of willfulness that private individuals... Yeah. Though it's mm. still the case. I mean, I always yeah. say, if you, ironically, if you have one show at Deer, it's actually quite likely that you'll probably mm. have a second yeah, and maybe is... a third. <laughs> if we do a first book with you, there'll probably be a second. Mm. But, but that's, mm. yeah. yeah, the nature of no, the No, I said that's quite, that's quite enviable. But on the other hand, then we might still be making large-scale sculptures of casts with Rachel Whyreed. Yes. You know, right. so yes. And, you know, for every project you do, there's another project you can't do because mm. our capacities are limited. So yes. that's, that's just our... That was our kind of That's choice. Thought, yes. And Nicholas, what about you? Is there somewhere, and it'd um, be great if you could give us an example of some of the works, because I think we've had a few examples, something concrete to also chew on. About the unique. Yes, yes. And we, if you want to discard that word, you can <laughs> um, too. Well, there is something unique, mm. and that is New York City. Yes, agreed. I realised having been a museum curator mm. um, by background, uh, that as a museum curator, essentially you are offering an artist the same thing that every other museum curator is mm. offering. Uh, my white cube is better than that white cube, <laughs> better funded, more prestigious. I could disagree on this, but I won't. <laughs> uh, you know, go ahead and disagree. <laughs> no, no. Uh, of course, you know, it, it's a rhetorical point, mm. but yes. um, there is a sort of, there's a hierarchy mm. of museums from MoMA, mm. you know, on down, and where you fit in the pecking order is sort of where you maybe can sort of land this artist mm. or that artist and... Uh, 
Um, what I realized when I started at Public Art Fund is, you know, when you can say to an artist, would you like to think of an idea for New York City? Mm. What other curator gets to say that? That's true. You have um, a very big playground. <laughs> it's, and so that's really special. It is. It's a special thing. Mm. And, and artists, you know, really tend to be excited mm. about that. Mm. They can also be paralysed by mm. it. Mm. And it can also take years to develop mm. projects. Mm. And we give them as long as they need. Yes. And they really... You can't really rush it, mm. and it has to be right. And I would say often, even though a simple idea is often the secret to something successful, the way that idea develops is always a fascinating journey. Mm. And I would say 90% of the time, what ends up happening is never what's been proposed. Yes. In the beginning. Yes. So, and a part of what's also rewarding as a curator is... Because artists can't practice doing a major public mm. work in New York City, mm. they're probably only getting one chance to do it in their career, they really want to get it right. Mm. And they want an organisation like ours with 40 plus years of mm. history to help them uh, really do it. So yes. they're much more open to feedback and dialogue mm. than, than I think sometimes was my experience working in museums where mm. artists feel like they know what they're doing, mm. they've done it before, mm. and they're sort of in their comfort zone. Yes. And this is a little bit different. A little bit different. And can you give me then an, an example, give us an example of something that you've worked on that addresses this idea of distinctiveness and that you really think exemplifies the work that you do? I've got your... Pro, your 2020 program, but it hasn't happened yet, but I, I could draw yeah. something out, but if you would I like mean, to... I mean, you know, great. I mean, one of the um, projects that we've done recently that I think there were some images uh, was for our 40th anniversary mm. uh, by Ai Weiwei called Good mm. Fences Make Good Neighbours, mm. and that was a project that uh, unfolded throughout the city. So it was in all five boroughs, more than 320 sites. Mm. And his idea was to, I mean, it was a very simple idea. Um, he wanted to put fences on buildings. Mm. And not with the idea of blocking people, but simply introducing this motif into the fabric of the city. Mm. And so using the urban infrastructure <coughs> Um, and the networks of the city as, as sort of connective tissue. Mm. So, um, so buildings, but interstitial spaces, like above buildings, between mm. buildings, um, subways, uh, stations, mm. bus shelters, um, signage, things that would normally be advertising mm. spaces, banners on lamp posts. Mm. Um, as well as major kind of freestanding sculptures mm. uh, that then gave you a sort of ground level experience mm. of the work. Uh, so something like that, which uh, really sort of took us into, you know, partnership with all kinds of different um, organizations from you know, Department of Transportation, to the Building Department, mm. to the Parks Department, and to Queens and Staten Island mm. and the Bronx, and the kind of project that was very topical. Um, I mean, the refugee crisis was, uh, mm. is still with us mm. and, and will be, mm. um, and the whole debate then that emerged in the 2016 election campaign mm. of, you know, the wall, um, yes. of course, came after mm. the exhibition had already been mm. sort of in development, mm. but then made it all the more sort of timely. Yes. Um, so the way an exhibition like that could really sort of bring the best out of an mm. artist in, in their own, um, you know, very much sort of socially engaged practice. Yes. Um, but be very relevant to 
you know, to the city of New mm. York and, and really experienced by people in their everyday lives mm. in a really powerful way. Mm. And contribute to very current debate. Because that was going to be one of my questions, but I can see we've got a little sign about wrapping up. But um, I think that all of you, through your examples, have shown that real commitment to the now and that real commitment to make a difference to society and to, and to do that in so many different ways. And I think that's really important. I mean, the other word that you might hate with uniqueness is that word of political activism or activism. But I think we've spoken about that just purely by example, which is the best way, I think, to, to talk about it. So I, don't, I think we don't need to talk about that again, but perhaps to, to end... There's Michael Landy's wonderful Random Acts of Kindness, which is reprised here in the gallery and has had everyone has everyone contributes to it. Everyone partakes, everyone goes down on a daily basis and has a look at all the little things that are mentioned. It's such a wonderful way of sharing. It's very it's very Michael Landy from the little bit that we know of him. And I'd love you to have as a final comment. Um, he, he had this, he, he himself, Michael Landy, had this, had this idea that he wanted to investigate what makes us human more than just consumers. And I'd love you to talk about that human connection if, you, if you'd like, just as a way to end tonight's um, wonderful discussion. Well, um, you know, I think that Michael's... Michael, that, that work, and Michael's, I mean, I think empathy is a very interesting um, way of, um, of thinking about quite a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, you know, creating a kind of, uh, a sort of sense of enabling people to connect, to empathize, to kind of uh, just connect with a work without um, kind of prejudging or directing them mm. as to what they might think or feel or how they might respond. Yes. Um, and, you know, as, as Nick was saying, that, that where these works really you know, take off is where they start to build a, a kind of a culture, a community mm. of connections. But that's lots of different people thinking and feeling different things. Yes. And that's what I think Michael Landy has done that in quite a few really of his beautiful. projects. Yes, including for you, yes. Just... When, I mean, something else I learned when I started at Public Art Fund that as a museum curator hadn't been the case. Mm. Um, I think you know, one of the first artists that I did a project with, Ryan Gander, it was actually Ryan's first sort of public piece, and uh, we'd had the opening, this was at the entrance to Central Park, um, there'd been a lunch and you know, so it was sort of, it was all over and I was like, Ryan, I'm, you know, what do you want to do now? Mm. You, you're free, obligations are done. Yes. And he's like, well, I'm just, I'm just going to go back to, to the piece. Mm. I'm like, oh, it, you know, everything okay? Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I just, um, you know, the most amazing thing for me has just been seeing people interact with mm. my work and sort of being a fly on the wall mm. and hearing their responses because, you know, at the, at the opening in a museum, everybody's invited and everyone's like very polite and positive and um, says lovely things mm. and you don't really know what people think. Mm. In public space, New Yorkers and, vis I mean, everyone just <laughs> says like whatever comes into their head. <laughs> and artists find that the most liberating mm. and wonderful thing, and I've seen it time and again, mm. they just, you know, are so excited to feel like their work is connecting mm. with people. Mm. Whatever that connection is, is yes. but that there is this human experience mm. of, of sharing their work mm. and, and then sort of getting something back. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Jessica? I think um, that I sort of echo all this. I would say that the, the word that was sort of in my mind was this sort of um, unmediated experience, you know, which mm. I, I think you're, you're both referring to in some sense, you know, that there's the, the um, which is often also a, a kind of social one in, in some shape or form as well. Mm. Um, but I think that perhaps, yeah, speaks to both empathy, but also to the, the kind of... Um, 
capacity for works to be encountered in this mm. in this way that's so completely unlike yeah the the structured experience of art within the confines of a of an institution mm. you know which is probably why you have so many different spaces that you run. So yeah, well, you can, yeah, works out mm. in the landscape, which mm. you know, perhaps you don't even know it's an artwork. It's yes. you know, just yeah, mm. a spiral in, in a lake. <laughs> yes, that's right. Look, I think we have to end it here tonight. That There's many more things that we could ask you, but really thank you so much for sharing your time. We know, Jessica, you've got a building project at the moment, so coming out is a huge thing for you, but I'm sure equally for you both as well. So we really, really appreciate it. There are things like this that, that um, we look forward to and really learn so much from the work that you do, and it's a real honour to have heard the three of you. So please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>